did a music degree. There we are. That's my interesting fact. Yeah, so for me it was interesting. I think the the aspects of my degree that I ended up focusing on were mostly quite non-musical in the way that people think about it. So I do play musical instruments in my spare time as like a hobby and, and so on, but actually the degree was itself based more around using music as a lens through mm -hmm. which to see the world, whether you're doing history but thinking about the critical musical moments in time philosophy you know what is sound there was a whole section called sound studies which was very interesting i ethnomusicology which is all all about studying music and culture and the relationships between the two i composition theory analysis all sorts of areas of the study of sound and music basically i with concerts and things thrown in for fun from time to time so how from that did you get into insurance? I, it was the only industry that was interested, I have to say, at the beginning, which is quite funny. I, I remember being, you know, a young, I, just before graduating, so I wasn't quite a graduate, but I was looking for internship programs and so on. And most uh, of the internship programs in the UK had this big sticker on them saying, uh, scientific degrees only, please. Or, you know, you must have, have completed a, a very technical degree in order to pursue our internship program. And I was very envious because most of my friends were going off to, you know, these big internship programs. So I, I'd searched desperately for an industry that accepted uh, people from mixed degree backgrounds. Uh, and luckily, insurance and actually Lloyd's of London uh, was an employer that was happy to take on people from a range of, of backgrounds degree wise. So my first ever internship was for the Corporation of Lloyds. Well, I think that this similar sort of similar experience that I had that when I graduated engineering school, it's like if you want to go to the big names, you had to pass a certain average, right? So there was always the dread that you don't have the 80 or the 85 so they will even look at your CV. And it's interesting that, well, actually, it's not interesting. It's a sort of an, a meaningless anecdote. Sorry for that. So I was basically, <laughs> <laughs> there is, no, your story is interesting. My story, eh, not so much. It's like yet another engineer trying to get into one of the big tech at the end of the day. I ended up at the Intel because they were nice enough to accept people that, you know, had what did they have like an average of 83 so it's like oh my god still like the average yeah. was 60 so i was still happy so you got into lloyd's and a few years later now you are the proud founder your founder and ceo right i'm not making it because it, there will be a title there like at the bottom of your yeah, we, with we, your name. We're not precious about titles and things. So there were there were three of us who founded the company together uh, or co-founded the company together. Um, two of us on the business side and one of us was a, a software engineering expert. So they naturally became the CTO. Uh, and then Jared, my co-founder and I, one was from a reinsurance broking background and I was from a reinsurance underwriting background. And we decided to imitate the, the Stripe brothers I uh, in the way that they'd molded themselves as CEO and president uh, together. So I, I got given president, which meant that for the first few, you know, funding conversations and so on, that everybody had a, a good laugh at my title, which was quite funny. It was also around the time, I think, that we were having changes in, in presidents around the world as well. So there were lots <laughs> of amusing comparisons drawn. But now now that the company's getting a bit bigger, it, it feels a little bit less silly. Uh, as a title, but we don't use them very much, fortunately. So I'm one of the co-founders, really. So before we queue and we actually jump into Supersave, which is coming, this is the main thing that we're having this conversation. Let's talk about you. We a little bit touch about how you got into insurance, but music got into Lloyd's. Can you tell us more about you and your journey before you started uh, Supersave? 
Absolutely. So when I started at Lloyd's, I it was amusingly in IT and operations where they put me first. So I got a bit of exposure to, to agile working and the people trying to change the market. I, I stayed at Lloyd's for a grad scheme after that as well. And again, this was always the theme. I, I was in risk for a while and then in strategy. And they sort of gave me a lot of the innovation questions as the new person. Uh, they say, oh, you, you use all the apps and the new technologies and things. What does Lloyd's look like, you know, in, in an app enabled world? Uh, you know, is, is it Tinder for Lloyd's? Is it uh, Rightmove or, or Zillow for Lloyd's? Or, or what, how, do, how are we going to be affected by this explosion of, you know, overnight successes and tech unicorns? What's, what's the Lloyd's one going to be? What year was uh, it? So I spent a lot of time doing that at first. What year was it? Uh, this would have been 2014-ish. So, so sort okay. of before yeah. the... I can see, I can see it's like you're swiping right uh, syndicates and risk. Okay. Or swiping left. Yeah. And then I, then I got a, hand, a, a chance to basically go out into the market and work for a Lloyd syndicate. Uh, and experiencing underwriting for myself. So I did my first 1-1 renewal season writing property catastrophe reinsurance business, uh, which was fascinating, really, really exciting, but also shone a light on just how manual uh, all of the processes were. I, I was very much a, a human photocopying machine or a professional remover of the bindings that uh, attached broker submissions together. So we, we would literally receive these big bundles of paper from the brokers and I would have to try and tear the binding off so that I could put them into the, the scanner so that we could get a, a digital copy of them. Or, or the rest of my time would often seem to be spent downloading files from file sharing portals or trying to find the right bits of data in Excel spreadsheets that had been sent to us in a zip folder. So I have this really critical first experience of wow this is what people are doing on the front lines of uh, reinsurance underwriting um, and then from there i moved on to aon uh, so the big broker but not actually as a broker uh, interestingly they have a, a consulting team called aon Impoint. at the time when i joined it was split between insurance and reinsurance so i joined the reinsurance team and we were advising reinsurance companies on strategy uh, so we would use Aon's data. Uh, so they have amazing data on, you know, all the transactions that Aon do. So at the time, it was pretty much a third of most markets. So you had a very good grounding in what was going on in different sectors around the world. And then you also had lots of great brokers in lots of lines of business who you could interview to get extra insight from. So we would effectively compete with McKinsey and BCG and all these big strategy consulting firms with the extra value that we had data and interviews at our fingertips that we could bring to any question, whether it was which country should we set up new offices in? How do we become more efficient? Uh, what do we need to look like to get higher signings? You know, how do we become a more effective reinsurance company? Could be anything. We, we, we would tackle all sorts of questions there. Um, and eventually I ended up becoming more and more focused on InsureTech at Aon. So first, more and more consulting projects became about InsureTech and innovation as that became the theme. Um, and eventually I became the sort of point person in, in London and in, in a few other European countries for startups that wanted to speak with Aon. Mm -hmm. I, I became a mentor with Startup Bootcamp InsureTech at the time as well. I and got involved in lots of the innovation programs that were happening in London got to know all these startups and began gradually to accumulate uh, lots of their wisdom about what to do and what not to do when you're looking to set up a, an insure tech startup. So when was, was the jump? Yeah, so the jump happened in 2019. Uh, so Jared uh, at that point was working for Tiger Risk, so a, a reinsurance broker. Uh, we were both training for our first marathon together in our spare time as well. Um, and we'd met Jezen, who was uh, working as a, a software developer elsewhere. Um, and we we got to a point where we said, this problem now that we've talked about with people and just validated a few times is really real. People really want us to solve it. They keep saying, 
go and do it, go and quit your jobs and do it. And some even said, we'll give you money to go and do this uh, because the industry needs it. Um, and so with that, we decided, right, let's, let's go for it. I had really amicable conversations with our employers and they said, yes, go and do it as well. We really want somebody to succeed in doing this. Uh, and so off we went uh, to try and build reinsurance technology for for the market. I think this is a classic, not classic, but uh, <laughs> the gold envy classic of uh, anyone who started a, a startup, but that his current employers and other people is like, here is money, here is our support, go bu- go build it. It's not that we cannot do that or in compete, but uh, you know, nothing negative. It's all about just push the industry forward. It's fantastic. So now that we reached that point, right, we started, so you started SuperSeed in uh, 2019. What exactly is SuperSeed? Yeah, so, so funnily enough, when, when we started, we were actually a company called RiskBook. Um, so Initially, I, we, had, we had this brief window before becoming fully fledged SuperSeed, I, and and with that initial risk book vision, what we really wanted to do was build a better means of trading business between brokers and reinsurers. So the broker and underwriter interactions. Um, it was around the time where Aon and Guy Carpenter had had launched AB Connect and GC Marketplace as mono broker placing platforms i guess so you could use ab connect if you worked at aon you could use gc marketplace if you worked at guy carpenter and then you had all of these other brokers who were sat there thinking do we need to build one of these as well and there was this huge risk that all the underwriters were sat with thinking are they all going to build one as well and you, you had this this possibility that the work of an underwriter was going to become extremely fragmented because they would have to visit a different broker's trading platform every time they wanted to do a deal with a different broker. And that was terrifying for them, especially as the expectation was the quality would reduce every time the player got perhaps smaller uh, in the process as well, in terms of budget they could allocate towards quite a complex system. Uh, So we saw this opportunity to say, right, let's build the independent reinsurance platform for brokers and for reinsurers to interact with. Um, and then a couple of years later, I, we, we rebranded as SuperSeed because we realized that we'd missed out a really critical ingredient to the reinsurance industry, which is the sedent. So the, the actual buyer of reinsurance policies. I, and and we, we, we brought onto our team, which was growing at the time, a, a brilliant actuary uh, called Paul Basson, who, who basically had, had lived and breathed the pain of I uh, receiving and preparing submission packs uh, from sedents uh, that typically contain lots of very complicated exhibits, but always in lots of different formats and structures across many, many tabs in Excel spreadsheets. Um, and we realized that what was actually slowing down a lot of the industry's adoption of digital was that all of the data being exchanged was being built once in an Excel for that particular renewal. And then once that renewal was done, sort of just being thrown in the bin. Um, And so we saw an opportunity to really help the sedents to have a structure that they could put their data into. Uh, So a a web application in this place where they could set up all of their exhibits that they were gonna share with their brokers and with their reinsurers uh, that could be then automatically validated so that it wouldn't have all the mistakes that Paul kept finding in his job and that everybody else in the industry is used to finding in these big uh, spreadsheets full of data. Uh, and that likewise, they'd have a feeling of reassurance that they're actually sending quality data to the markets when they're trying to get the best price uh, on these massive, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars worth of reinsurance uh, deals. Um, so we we added that component basically to our our platform so that it became rather than just broker to reinsurer, sedent to broker to reinsurer, tripartite, a sort of ecosystem serving as as a a reinsurance platform. 
and hence we hope to make it super to seed uh, or super seed and that's how we how we came to be yeah so if you don't mind let's do a little bit of a definition so uh, i would say that <clears throat> sorry um the main audience of this video podcast actually are it's really spread but startups insurance executives professionals agents so from all over but mainly us a little bit of europe so we don't really i don't know how familiar people are with lloyds with the market and of course with the different structure of working with the reinsurance can you give us a little bit of definitions how do who are these entities and how they work and what's their functionality yeah it's 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 a really niche part of the industry but a really important part yeah uh, that's a of, part of that, the business uh, as well and that's a part that deals with the big contracts and a lot of money and a lot a lot of data absolutely yeah no we we, we have i think as a reinsurance community we have a very high opinion of ourselves <laughs> <laughs> because we get to do the big glamorous deals and and the big money and all that sort of thing but um yeah the the way it tends to work and, and again to, to relate that back to the experiences of most people in the insurance industry um when you've got a someone selling motor insurance let's say if you're an agent or if you're working at a, a direct insurer uh, you're adding policies to a portfolio and eventually at the end of the year let's say you're building up a portfolio with your team full of motor insurance policies um depending on the insurer uh, or the mga or whatever type of vehicle it is that's accumulating this portfolio they'll have a a different appetite in terms of how much of that portfolio they might want to keep and to hold on to the pure sort of risk of with those policies um, they might want to remove some of the risk because of exposure so they might be worried that they're holding too much a uh, risk for whatever it might be motor liability or it might be catastrophic exposure from hailstorms or similar in which case they might need to buy reinsurance for that uh, alternatively they might want to get more of their income from charging for the services that they offer uh, in order to get customers through the door so effectively they can say we don't actually want as a business to focus on uh, holding the risk and hoping that the claims go well we'd rather let reinsurers take that part of the business and focus on being really good at claims payment, distribution, uh, sales of policies, uh, et cetera, in which case they might buy actually loads of reinsurance because they just rather somebody else did that bit. And often because they provide access to business, they can charge quite a nice commission, what we call a seeding commission to the reinsurers in exchange for providing reinsurers with business uh, that the reinsurers can then add to their own uh, sort of portfolios of portfolios um, but the way that this tends to work is that for each portfolio or sometimes multiple portfolios you buy a policy um, there are many types I won't go into all the different types of policy that you can buy uh, for reinsurance but it, it yeah it would be a, a very long conversation we, we, we have a podcast dedicated to this if you're curious called the reinsurance podcast of course the real reinsurance nerds out there um, but I recommend it. So for the out. audience, where can but, they um, find your podcast? Yeah, we are on Spotify. We're on Apple Music, but it's it's simply called uh, The Reinsurance Podcast. Uh, and not many people have made podcasts uh, dedicated to reinsurance or even episodes. So you won't have trouble finding it, I'm <laughs> sure. Or, or you can find it on our LinkedIn page, on, on Superseed's LinkedIn page as well. Um, but yeah, so, so basically when, when they've assembled this portfolio, they typically have a seeded re-team or an outwards re-team in, in Lloyd's. So where in this marketplace where there's lots of very small syndicates that all trade under the Lloyd's brand uh, and a lot of shared services and things, uh, it might even be the underwriters themselves who do this because their teams tend to be very small. Um, but somebody has to take the responsibility of preparing a kind of a pitch a, this is why you should reinsure us uh, to the market. Um, 
and into this pitch goes a whole bunch of, of useful bits of information. A bit like if you're trying to sell your house and you've got to say how many bedrooms it's got and what the floor plan looks like and how many bathrooms it has and, and so on. It's, it's, it's that sort of thing, but all about your portfolio. So how many policies did you write? Uh, what are the values of those things? It could be you know properties or cars or cyber insurance policies, but what are the values of those policies? Could be locations and addresses. Uh, a lot of the time though, it goes way beyond the things themselves. It starts to go into rate change information. So how much could you, the insurer, charge for those policies versus what you could charge in the previous 10 years? Um, and loss information, how many claims have you experienced on those policies uh, as well? And because it's reinsurance, what you're actually doing, much like if you were buying an insurance policy, is you're buying in advance for that portfolio. So everything you're doing has to be kind of a, a forward-looking guess in your pitch as to what you think you're going to need for the next year. So you might buy um, reinsurance based on an imaginary estimate of how many flights your airline is going to do, uh, or your aviation portfolio is going to cover in the next year, uh, which is, is, is a guess that you, know, you have to convince uh, the market of as part of your pitch as well. So you've got to draw them a nice trend line and say, we've grown 10% every year. So we think next year as well, we'll have this many policies uh, as well. So, that, so what ends up happening then is this big pitch gets prepared internally and they then go to the brokers. So mm -hmm. most sedents work with reinsurance brokers. Uh, it is possible to go direct. Uh, at SuperSeed, we focus on the business that goes through brokers. Uh, and then these reinsurance brokers basically help the the students to get all of that information into a, a useful shape and a structure and check that it makes sense within the narrative, but also make sure that it's actually going to fit what markets are interested in. So when I say markets, reinsurance underwriters are interested in writing uh, and that it's answering all the questions that they're going to need answers to. Um, so the brokers really help tailor that pitch Mm -hmm. and get it ready to go to market. And then the brokers have a whole separate job themselves, which is really difficult, which is uh, a bit like in, in complex uh, subscription insurance business. So, so business which includes multiple underwriters, a uh, subscription business where several people all take a line on the same risk because it's such a big deal. Um, in the same way in reinsurance, you can sometimes end up with 50, 60, 70 different reinsurance companies on a single placement. So that one big portfolio that you're trying to reinsure, the broker then has the job of having to find 100 different companies to ask in the hope that 70 of them agree to take part. So when you started, was the MVP more about uh, organizing and structuring the data so you can have that 70 uh, insurers or reinsurers looking at the same file or was it also for cleaning the data up uh, in actually uh, auto populating or data enrichment of data so they can make the case yeah so the, the order in the, in the way that SuperSeed was born i guess was we started off with Brokers have a, a really tough job of managing the back and forth interactions around a deal with mm -hmm. you know 50 different reinsurance companies because they have to go and ask them all for well, they have to get everything ready, then go and ask everybody for a quote on multiple layers because there's retentions and limits and many, many layers stuck on top of each other and they all need to be quoted individually. Um, and then once you've got your quotes in, you need to issue firm order terms to all of the different markets that you're working with. And then once you start collecting authorizations, you've got to track those and present them back to your client and ultimately decide then who's going to get what signings. And in reinsurance, it's like, we're going to give this market 2%, this one mm -hmm. half a percent. And sometimes, you know, some, some, bigger, some bigger layers or bigger signings get given, so but a lot of the time... It, it's a huge project just to make sure everybody gets a signing that adds up to 100%. So part one of SuperSeed, which was called Riskbook, was that initial challenge 
how do you make it possible for a broker to do this rather so than having manage the this relation- giant spreadsheet tracker? So it's managing the relationships, having all the checks and the, basically that, I would say, uh, a pipeline for the process, making sure that everyone has all the checks and signage and, well, as you said, also allocation. Is there a discovery element to that or ju- they know already and, and they have that relationship management in a different location? Is that part of the platform? So we, we do offer a little bit of the discovery between brokers and reinsurers. Mm-hmm. I think initially when we first started, we worked mostly with smaller brokers who didn't have as many of those relationships, I especially from country to country or even continent to continent. So we, we did offer... Uh, and still do offer the ability to find new reinsurers as a broker or as a reinsurer to look for brokers doing business in a a country that maybe you don't do much business in. Uh, But we found that as our brokers that we work with have got a bit bigger, they tend to have global offices and know everybody already. So it's it's more of a convenience uh, contact management, relationship management kind of tool for them in that sense. How long this process takes without uh, SuperSeed? So it's a, a sort of two-step process. So the pre-placement part, which is the, the newer piece of SuperSeed, getting everything ready and checked, all of those Excel spreadsheet information into one digital submission pack, that, that typically used to take up to three months uh, without SuperSeed to get these big data packs ready to go to market. Uh, with SuperSeed, it takes about a week, a couple of weeks uh, to get everything ready and back and forward and checked. Uh, it's a really sizable change there. Then once you've got the data ready, you then have to actually get the deal placed. Um, and this is an interesting part. So ideally, most clients tend to try and want to get this done as quickly as possible within the renewal season. So, so there's sort of a, we need to wait until this date to get started. Uh, because we're waiting for enough information to be ready for our pitch. And then once our information is ready for our pitch, we want to go to market uh, and get the deal done in advance of market conditions changing unexpectedly or or similar uh, in time for it to be ready for the 1st of January. Typically, there are some other renewal seasons, but most most deals go go ready for the 1st of January. Um, And the, the traditional approach has been that everybody misses Christmas and New Year and is working right up until the 31st of December. In some cases, the deal's still not done, you know, a few days after New Year's Day, um, which is very challenging for, you know, all these poor people in the industry are having to work overtime uh, at that time of year. And for the clients who wanted to have contract certainty that their reinsurance coverage was in place. Um, so we, again, take that process, which can be you know, a couple of months of deal making, um, quoting, authorizing, signing, binding, um, et cetera, and bring it down into the kind of thing that, again, depending on how quickly people respond and whether they want to be more ambitious and try out new structures because they have more time, um, we, we can bring that down to the length of a demo. So it's as fast as the markets want to move at that point. There's much less admin uh, and back and forth in the process. But I think one of the things that's been so one of the things that I think has been really attractive there actually is with more time, I, people are able to try and do more. We, we had a lot of comments in the last renewal season for reinsurance that because of everything going on and because the market being a bit tough, um, brokers had to tell their clients, we know you'd like to try different renewal structures this year. So let's say last year you had a reinsurance tower that was this shape and it had these triggers and so on, and it had these things that it covered. Uh, we know that you would like us to explore this different shaped tower or these other triggers, um, but the brokers have to say a lot of times to their clients, we're sorry, we don't think there's time to get a new deal done. So do you mind if we just do the same deal again and just hope everyone goes along with it? Which is a real shame. That's like a real letdown for your, your clients in the market if you can't do that because everybody was just overwhelmed with the amount of admin uh, in the renewal season that they have to deal with. So we're hoping that by cutting out that admin, we make it a lot easier for people to be a bit more innovative and to explore new ways of structuring a deal. We have 
built into the placements app a way of spinning up several different structures very quickly and offering them for quoting at the same time so that you're not sort of running about trying to make sure the right people get the right information for the right offers and, and quotes and so on. So I, that's something that we think will enable people to use that renewal window a lot more effectively and ultimately get a better deal for their clients in the process. It's very important. At the end of the day, what you're offering here is efficiency and the ability to act in a timely manner. And if you can use that and actually provide help the reinsurers offer their customer a better solution or in that the brokers, etc., it's a win-win-win, right? You have three parties, three entities playing in this game and everyone can win and, and get a better solution. Okay, yeah, so let's let's talk a little bit more about Superseed, the team. So you started in 2019. How many, peop- how many people are on the team now? So we're up to 30 people now, ah. uh, which is exciting. So uh, growing fast and, and expanding our, our footprint. So there's uh, a lot more of us over in the US now as well. So I'm mm-hmm. sure you'll, you'll be bumping into our colleagues uh, in no time if you haven't already. And if you can share, how much money did you raise? Yeah, so currently I think we are we're preparing to do a a, a series A probably in in about a year's time. I, I would say. Oh, that's cool I, because so you know why comfortably because now we can talk actually about why you're raising money and what's your plans for the future. Yeah, no, it's, it's a very good lead, and indeed, so. Um, yeah, as mentioned, I think I think at the moment, you know, we, we've been really privileged to work with a number of uh, specialist software investors, uh, mostly based in the UK. Um, so some of them probably won't be familiar to to a US audience, but uh, but some of the the first checks on some really big uh, European startups uh, have come from uh, the same group of of sort of seed investors in the UK, but. We've been very careful to stay neutral throughout this whole process uh, and to make sure that we keep the marketplace uh, and the, the ecosystem uh, as independent as possible because there is this risk that, you know, if a big broker or a big underwriter owned a meaningful share of the technology that everybody wanted to use, people would be uncomfortable putting their data into it. So we've been very careful throughout that process to make sure that we only get third party uh, investment into into Superseed. Um, but where that's going to take us, I guess, in future, as, as we look to, you know, next fundraising opportunities, I, we really recognize that at the moment, reinsurance is being held back as an industry by how difficult it is to get reinsurance. Uh, so at the moment, insurance companies or any company that's looking to buy reinsurance only really does it as, as few times a year as it possibly can because it's so painful to do so, because it's not a product that can be arranged or a service that can be arranged at that company's fingertips. It really is, if we want reinsurance, we're gonna be spending a a two or three month project to to get that reinsurance. We're going to be disrupting everybody internally to get the data we need to evidence that we are able to be reinsured. And so really these companies limit the amount of reinsurance they're willing to buy. And in doing so they limit a lot of their strategic options, they limit uh, a lot of their capital options, their growth opportunities, uh, and indeed their potential results when it comes to the end of that year or a given period of, of time. So I think our, our dream really at Superseed is to remove those barriers to getting reinsurance, to again, make it super to seed so that people seed a lot more often. Uh, I was speaking to somebody from the life reinsurance industry recently we, we focus at supersede on the non-life so pnc property and casualty and specialty etc uh, industry uh, at supersede at the moment where i think according to swiss re it's, it's something around 12 percent i so just around 10 percent really of all insurance on the non-life side gets then rebought as reinsurance so that's we've got it. sort of a, a 10% usage of reinsurance and, and that's about it at the moment. So it's 2 trillion 
ish of, of PNC insurance that becomes two hundred billion dollars of, of reinsurance. And in life reinsurance, on the other hand, it's it's a complete flip. It's it's something like ten percent, you know, of the original business stays with the insurers, and ninety percent goes then into the reinsurance market. Um, and, and again, partly that's due to the smaller number of players where they've been able to make it much easier to to do this and slightly different mechanics in the market. But I, I think we could get to a position where reinsurance customers everywhere welcome the opportunity to have that kind of relationship with the reinsurance market, where as an insurance company, they're really focused on their ability to be really effective providers of insurance of to, to sell their product, which is really, you know, the promise to pay, the claims payment, the services associated with it, the expertise, the risk, all, all of that element there that they offer in their insurance brands, letting that really be their focus and handing over a much larger portion of the capital management side, the reinsurance side to the reinsurance industry. Um, so I would love to see SuperSeed become that vehicle, that, that grease in the wheels that enables reinsurance to grow from, you know, 10% of a two trillion market to more like, you know, 30% in a few years, if not 50% and beyond, uh, as it just becomes much easier to buy reinsurance. Now I need to, to add to my previous phrase, it's now it's going to be win, 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 win situation. As you increase the pie, as you increase and help the industry. Okay, great. Let's re we are at the, oh, wow, actually 37 minutes in. Um, let me ask you the same question that I'm asking everyone at the end of uh, the episode. Do you have a recommendation? Can you give the audience a recommendation, something that you picked up in the past two years, a movie, a life hack, a book that you really like to share? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. So nice to bookend the conversation in, in the same way we started it. So I mentioned that I was a, a musician, you know, previously. Uh, the One of the books that I read recently that, that I thought was brilliant taking that musical experience forwards uh, was a, a management book uh, written by a, a conductor, so an orchestral maestro. Um, it's actually called The Ignorant Maestro. And, and in this book, uh, he makes the point of the fact that as a leader, a lot of the time, you have to let people get on with it and empower them to get on with it um, and not try to control everything perfectly. There's this really, really interesting balance between leadership and, and, and how that means controlling versus empowering. Um, and some of the things that he talked about there, I think, have a lot of meaning for the insure tech world, because typically we have expertises which are very different you have people who are experts in insurance or reinsurance like we do at supersede and then next to them you have experts in software development and it's a bit like having you know the the people who play the stringed instruments the the violins the cellos etc and then the experts who play the wind instruments the flutes and, and the piccolos or whatever it might be um and it's unlikely that you as the conductor are going to be as good at playing the, the trombone or whatever it might be as the person who plays the trombone in the orchestra they're always going to be the expert and maybe you have some experience playing the cello at some point but again that's not your job your job is not to be another member of that section you've got to help all of these different sections who are very different to each other to play the same thing and to play together really really well for your customer the audience uh, and that that leadership role of bringing together very diverse skill sets into a coherent whole, which we hear as a piece of music, I thought was a really powerful analogy and a really useful one for uh, leaders when you have a very changing talent base, uh, such as we do now in InsureTech. Fantastic. Ben, it was a pleasure having you. Thank you very much for staying late and well, waking me early and have you on the show. <laughs> A pleasure being here. Thank you again and uh, look forward to, to listening back and, and spreading InsureTech talk around the UK as well. It's my pleasure. Man.